Welcome to the Capital News. I am your host, Alex Caritas. Today is 3-14-2019, so that means it's Pi Day. Well, happy Pi Day to everybody out there, especially my mathematicians. It's a great number, isn't it? If you know all of the numbers, I congratulate you. Of course, it just keeps going, so you don't. But it's a great day. I hope everyone is doing well. So today, let's get into some of the economic news. Let's start with the markets. S&P was down 2.5 points. The Dow was up 7 NASDAQ was down 12 and a half, and the Russell 2000, the small cap index, was down six and a quarter points. So not a whole bunch of excitement on these markets. Again, they are hitting up against technical resistance levels. Of course, that may have been the cause of the pullback that occurred last week. And then, of course, we had another mini V-shaped rally earlier in the week. But now we're up against that resistance point once again, and there just does not seem to be enough oomph or enough positive catalyst somewhere waiting in the wings to propel these markets higher. Again, we know President Trump's wishes and tweet that the markets are supposed to go up, up, up and hit new highs. We'll see if that takes place in the midst of a global slowdown. So there is a huge disconnect. We are in the financial and economic world of Oz. So the markets can most definitely rally and make new highs. Off of the back of what news, I really don't know because most of what we're getting is negative or just so-so. I mean, there are some good glimmers here and there, but a lot of the stuff that might be something that looks positive is stuff that already happened. So it's more of a lagging indicator, not a forward leading indicator. So that gives us some concern. Oil settled above $58 a barrel, so it's getting up there. Again, we talked about the supply issues yesterday with stockpiles being less than what was anticipated. So you have demand and supply issues at play there that may be affecting the price of oil, although you are starting to see a little bit of a weaker a weaker dollar, but that it all depends on the currency. Again, there is so much going on. There's a lot of decoupling. There's just a lot of craziness going on out there because we have gold below $1,300. Below $1,300 an ounce, despite its recent little rally above $1,300 earlier in the week. So what's going on here? I mean, you would think if you have a weaker dollar, you're going to get higher oil prices, which is what we're seeing. But then you'd also think that you're going to see higher gold and silver prices. But gold is back down below $1,300. And silver also retreated a little bit and now settled at uh, $15.27 an ounce. So what's going on here? I don't know. I really don't know because we are in the land of Oz. I know what should be taking place. I know how markets should be behaving if there really was a whole bunch of common sense around this place, but there isn't. So it's just anybody's guess as to what's going to happen because it's headlines that move the market. And sometimes... A small beat to the upside just propels markets a couple hundred points for the day. And then when you get bad news that confirms a whole bunch of stuff, eh, it's no, we, we, eh, it's no problem. It's no problem. I, I can't make heads or tails of it. But I do know one day, I do know one day that the markets will catch up with the truth of the underlying economy. And when that day happens, it will not be pretty. We're just in a slowdown. It's just the end of the cycle. This is what happens. It didn't have to happen this way to this extreme with all this money printing, but that's where we're at. And I think it's going to be somewhat proportionate to the nonsense to the upside. So that means it's probably going to be a severe problem to the downside, either in a quick collapse or maybe a prolonged recession or potentially depression, depending on the catalyst and the nature of how this thing unwinds. I mean, the party doesn't go on forever, everybody. You you know, you have the time of your life at a great party. Eventually, it's lights out. You got to go home. It's the same thing here. Same thing here. I don't want to be a party pooper, but you know, if if it's going to protect you and your family and your finances, well, then I'm glad I'm I'm saying it because in my heart of hearts, that's what I believe is going to happen. I just can't time it. If I could, I'd tell everybody it's going to happen on this day, such and such time. Get ready for it. In the meantime, you know, relax because we know exactly when it's going to happen. We don't know exactly when it's going to happen. And because of that, you have to be prepared. Now, if we look at the bond market, the 10-year bond was up, so there was some selling, so the yield is now at 2.63%. The pound 
still remains at about $1.32 to the U.S. dollar. We have, of course, a little bit more Brexit news for you, and obviously I discussed that on the Political Geopolitical podcast earlier, but yes, no surprise, Brexit looks like it's going to be extended. Of course, there is going to be another vote for the prime minister's deal that it was shut down once in January, earlier this week. It will probably get struck down a third time, but who knows? Maybe somebody will say enough's enough. We're all going to get together and vote for it third time's a charm. That's a possibility, but I think it's more likely that they will extend. They voted to do as much, so we'll see how long they kick the can down the road. It looks at this time that they may actually do so to potentially June 30th, so that's another three months, take us well into the spring, early early summer. Uh, come on, guys, get it together, get it together. I'm, I'm sick and tired of all these politicians just saying things are difficult and it's hard. You've had two and a half, three years, get your act together or get out of there. Now, at the time of this podcast, always, I do this later in the evening, so we have the Asian markets open. And as it sits right now, we have the Nikkei, the Japanese markets, up over 200 points or 1%. And then we have the Hong Kong markets up over 200 points as well, which also represents an increase of about 1%. Then back to the states. Obviously, I've been talking about Boeing recently because of the the, the plane crash that occurred in Ethiopia in the the previous one. I think it was uh, Lion Air. It had the same Boeing model aircraft, the 737 MAX 8 and 9, uh, ran into a little bit of trouble there. Those planes were grounded by pretty much every country around the world. The U.S. was pretty much the last country to do so. We did so the other day, and today the share price of Boeing is is actually down an additional 1%. I know there was some other news that came out that was not uh, in their favor today, but it did pull back another percentage point. Despite uh, the fact that it kind of rallied, even after President Trump grounded those air flights. I mean, after the news, obviously, it it, it tanked, the share price tanked, but then it rebounded rather quickly and closed up for the day, which was actually surprising. But um, today it was back down 1%. And then, of course, we knew we couldn't go much longer than a week without talking about U.S.-China trade talks. And where we currently sit with this is, get this, remember, you have to remember the timeline. We thought only a few weeks ago, according to White House senior officials and Larry Kudlow himself coming out and saying this was a fantastic, historic, and remarkable idea, well now, ladies and gentlemen, it seems that the world leaders, President Trump and President Xi, will not be meeting until the earliest in April. Remember, we were told from Larry Kudlow that it might have been taking place this week, Uh, Only a few weeks ago, we were told, down in Mar-a-Lago, we're scheduling it. We're going to make this happen. These two gentlemen are going to meet. They're going to do their signing ceremony. They're going to hash out the final details. And this is going to be the best deal known to man. This was supposed to potentially happen this week. And then, of course, that didn't happen. And then we were told, well, maybe March 27th will be the day of this historic meeting and this historic signing of this historic and remarkable deal. Nah, now we don't know. Now, well, then, you know, Larry Kudlow came out and kind of said, well, it's not in cement. Maybe it'll take place the end of March, maybe sometime early April. Now it's April at the earliest. So what's going on here? Are the Chinese taking a page out of President Trump's playbook, his deal-making book? Are they also understanding the art of the deal? I mean, they are from the country of the art of war, Okay, that historic masterpiece of literature. Seriously, read it. The Art of War, it's a good book. Short, you can read it in a day. Maybe the Chinese are saying, look, and I've had this conversation with you guys before. If the Chinese are looking, you know, really long term, and they might not really like what's taking place in this deal and these negotiations, I mean, look, look at what their calculus might be. President Trump is only president for at least another two years. Okay, at most, maybe another six if he wins. They might think he's not going to win. So you have their leadership, President Xi, who may very well be the president of that country for the remainder of his life versus somebody who may be out in two years or six. You know, they're, they're, they're weighing their odds, their probability, you know, because then you're going to get potentially some nutbag in there, you know, Pocahontas, Spartacus, Kamala Harris, or crazy Bernie in there, and they're just going to run rampant 
on those idiots because they're not going to know what's what's taking place. The, the Chinese will just take them, I mean, they'll eat their lunch. That's what will happen. So at least now they have somebody who's a, who is actually a, a deal maker and is understanding that there are issues that need to be discussed and they're being discussed. But they, the Chinese, might not like the direction and where it's going. And they might say, well, you know what, we just saw President Trump get up from the negotiating table with Kim Jong-un and he walked away and sometimes you got to walk away. And that's very true. Sometimes you got to walk away. Well, maybe that's what the Chinese are doing. I don't know. You don't know. Nobody knows except the people who are making this deal behind the scenes. Those are the only people who know because we're definitely not being told the truth because we were told this is the best deal ever. Well, if it's the best deal ever, then it has to be good for everybody. So why wouldn't there be a signing ceremony? I mean, President Trump should want this. President Xi should want this. I mean, because President Xi at least knows that his economy is slowing down. President Trump, I think he knows it's slowing down, but won't admit as much. He will continue to say it's the, it's the best thing ever. It's an economic miracle we're in the midst of. Of course, you pay attention to this show. You know that's not true because we actually look at the data, the real data, and tell the real story. Okay? Again, are there some good glimmers here and there? Yeah. But net-net, it's, it's, it's not good. It's definitely no economic miracle. It's definitely not the best economy this country has ever experienced. That's not even close to being an argument. But again, that's the hyperbole. That's the exaggeration of a businessman slash master marketer salesman. Okay, I get that from the political point. But it doesn't do any real service to the people who he's supposed to be serving at the end of the day. So I have a problem with that. But in, in regards to these U.S.-China trade talks, where do we stand? Because, again, the president wants to get up there and say, well, we're making billions and billions of dollars that's just pouring into the treasury because the Chinese are paying us billions and billions of dollars, which, of course, is not the case. American businesses and the consumer are paying those billions and billions of dollars. Because you have to understand, the Chinese are not yet really affected by this in the grand scheme of things. Okay, They are in the midst of becoming more of a domestic economy. And what I mean by that is they are turning more towards themselves to be a consumer-driven economy, much like the United States is, as opposed to an export-driven country. Okay, So they're not getting whacked as much as one might think. And you also have to understand, ladies and gentlemen, again, this is a 10% tariff on what? $200, $250 billion worth of Chinese goods. That's $20 billion. We're talking hundreds of billions of dollars. We're talking about two economies that are, you know, combined over $30 trillion. $20 billion is nothing, is nothing, okay? However, however, it does have an effect on the American consumer, especially an American consumer that is stretched too thin, and we all know this. We all know that the American consumer is stressed too thin because we pay attention to the data. We pay attention to the information. We know that 7 million... Americans are 90 days plus past due on their car payments. That's a record that blows past the Great Recession. It blows past it. And this is in the midst of the best economy, we're told. So that doesn't jive. We have record student loans. We have record credit card loans and defaults waiting in the wings. Student loan defaults wait, occurring and waiting in the wings. We have the auto market that I just mentioned. We have mortgages again hitting levels that were hit pre-crisis, okay? There is too much debt. I don't care if you want to report employment data and wage data that there's wage growth of 3, 3.4%. That's good. It's finally, finally, it's starting to trickle down to the average Joe. But guess what? So have all his other costs, and they've gone up way more than 3.4%. So net-net, it's really not a benefit. It just might buy him another day or two of, of living, I mean, it's not good enough. It's not good enough. And you have, and again, I had this conversation on the last podcast because it was such a shock. Well, it really wasn't a shock to me. But you have the Boeing situation, and we have an acting Secretary of Defense who was a former executive of Boeing, and you have the military-industrial complex, Boeing, Northrop Grumman, you know the list. Their share prices have been, I mean, they've just skyrocketed. They've just skyrocketed. So I thought we were draining the swamp. I thought the military-industrial complex was supposed to be called in. I thought that was supposed to be minimized. I thought that was the game. I thought that was what was supposed to happen. And 
And on top of that, we have a $4.75 trillion budget. And I think, just to correct myself from yesterday, I think I said that was 2019's budget. No, that's 2020's budget. So I just want to correct that. But nevertheless, $4.75 trillion. I thought we were supposed to drain the swamp. That's a record budget. Where is the restraint? Where is the fiscal restraint? Where are the supposed, uh, what do you want to call them, fiscally conservative Republicans? Where are they? Why aren't they shouting at the rooftops that this is out of control? Because this budget, by its own admission, says that there's going to be trillion-dollar deficits for the eye to see, as far as the eye can see. So when's it going to stop? When is it going to stop? Okay, and now let me again get back to U.S.-China trade talks. I'm sorry, I get on a rampage sometimes and I just go off all over the place. But U.S.-China trade talks, where will this end? Because was the real reason that President Trump said, let's, okay, we'll hold off on additional tariffs because the talks are going tremendously well. Is that true? Are the talks going tremendously well, so we'll hold off on additional tariffs? Or does the president really know who's paying those tariffs? And it's the consumer and it's American businesses. And he knows that if he upped them to 25%, that's more money out of your pocket for less goods and services. So he wants GDP to be as high as possible. Well, if, if you have less money to spend and you got additional costs you have to pay for because of artificial means, a.k.a. the tariffs, mm, now the president sort of just boxed himself in. Maybe these negotiations aren't going that well. Maybe he understands that it isn't China paying billions and billions of dollars into the treasury. It's you and me and everybody else who has to go pay for more expensive goods and services, and he doesn't want the price to go up even further artificially. Hmm. Could be that too, couldn't it? Because again, with this whole drain the swamp thing being a, a master deal maker, we were told that these deficits were going to go down. Well, the trade deficits have been are, are the largest in history. Largest in history. Don't follow anybody blindly. Don't get caught up in a cult of personality. Yes, he's doing a lot of good things, but you know what? There's a lot of there's a lot of broken promises too. Okay? Don't let them pull you along for too much longer because it's already going on 2 years. Before you know it, it'll be four. And how big's the debt and deficit's going to be by then? How much bigger are the trade deficits going to be by then? Don't let it turn into an abusive relationship. Well, he loves me. He just, you know, he got out of hand that one. No, no. Uh-uh. You better pay attention. Because just because you like the guy, just because he's saying what you like to hear, doesn't mean it's actually going to take place. And I'm keeping my eyes on this guy really closely because it's getting close. I talk about fireworks coming on a geopolitical, political podcast all the time. I think that that might happen. I'm hoping that it happens, that there's a true draining of the swamp. But I'm becoming more and more skeptical because you have to look at what we were told and then what's actually taking place. So something else I want to get to uh, that has to deal with the markets just in general, just something that I want everybody to be aware of because this is obviously in the same vein of those 30 market risks that we've discussed uh, many times here uh, for 2019, that list that was put together by Deutsche Bank. But there's a whole, again, there's a whole host of other things uh, that exist that we can talk about. And one of the things that we have to talk about, I believe, has to deal with the amount of corporate debt that exists on these corporate balance sheets, which are at a record high, by the way. It's over $6 trillion, over $6 trillion. It's more than doubled since the financial crisis. So if you want to know where a lot of this funny money has went, it's, it's gone into these corporations. And what have they done with this money? Well, they've made themselves look good, and we've had this discussion many times over. They've, they've purchased their own shares. Well, what does that do? Well, that retires shares, so now it makes their earnings look bigger than what they otherwise would have been. So it's an artificial means. It's, it's financial engineering. It's good for the investor until it isn't. Because if they're doing this organically with cash flow that they have coming into the business, that's one thing. And they want to reward shareholders by doing that. Okay, I get that. But if they're doing it with funny money, well, one day you're going to have to pay the piper back. And how are you going to do that? Are you going to be able to maintain those types of profit margins? Are you going to be able to maintain that level of earnings? Because that's really what determines the price of shares is their level of earnings. And if you've been... I don't want to say fixing the books, but financially engineering your books, which is most definitely the case, 
to have higher earnings than you otherwise would have, what happens when that, uh, that punch pool gets taken away? And we're starting to see that punch pool being taken away by the Federal Reserve increasing interest rates and taking money off of their balance sheet. So this is where we're getting into, okay? So this is very important to pay attention to the corporate debt market because we now start to have investment grade and high yield uh, bonds, also called junk bonds, coming due. The first wave of corporate bonds coming due is this year. And most of it is investment grade, which relative to high yield or junk bonds is obviously supposed to be the safer bet. We're talking $700 billion in investment grade corporate debt that is coming due this year. That's an astronomical amount. It needs to be paid. So the question goes, where's the money going to come from for these corporations to make these payments? Now, you start looking down next year and the year after and the year after pretty much until 2023, 2024. And now you really start to get not only the investment grade bonds coming due, but also the high yield junk bonds coming due. You're talking a few trillion dollars worth of debt. So pretty much everything that has been built up since the Great Recession is now coming home to roost, okay, at a time when we are at the end of an economic business cycle. I can't make this crap up. How are these companies going to have the money to pay off these bonds? The amount of bankruptcies that may happen could be historic. We already see it in the retail space. People want to blame Amazon. You look at the numbers behind that, people still go to brick and mortar stores. Yeah, the websites are most definitely growing. E-commerce is definitely becoming a bigger part of the game, but that is an excuse, ladies and gentlemen. Somebody says it's Amazon, call BS. Call BS. Tell them, listen to the Capital News with Alex Caritas. He'll give you the truth. It's BS. E-commerce is still a small part of the overall retail market. It just is. People like to touch and feel things. They like to see them in person. And some things, that's just how you're going to, you're just going to, you know, do the transaction. It's just going to be that way. Okay. Is the internet going to get bigger? Sure. Absolutely. But don't let people tell you that all of these retail stores are failing and going bankrupt because of Amazon, because it just ain't true. Why they're going bankrupt is because they've taken on all of this funny money, tried to prop themselves up, couldn't do it, couldn't generate enough sales because the consumer is already stretched too thin, and it doesn't take an economist to figure this one out. They don't have the cash flow coming in. They're going out of business, and that's what we're seeing with company after company. Now, another thing I want to make everybody aware of, because I think this is hugely important, if you recall from 0809 and before, this is to the lead up, you had the U.S. rating agency. So you're talking about S&P, you're talking about Fitch, you're talking about Moody's. These are the guys that stamp financial products, triple A, double A, single A, triple B, junk, whatever, okay? That's their job. They go in, they had a team, they look at these financial instruments, they look at the, the party risks, they look at, you know, everything, supposedly, and they make a determination as to how they're going to classify it. Obviously, AAA being it's, it's a gold standard. It, it's, there's basically minimal risk. This thing isn't going to default, no failure, all that type of stuff. Well, if you remember from 08, 09, these rating agencies were basically rubber stamping almost every Wall Street financial product, AAA or AA. I mean, it was high-grade investment, bar none. It was the gold standard as far as these guys were concerned. Now, what was the problem with this? Well, that wasn't true. That wasn't true. A lot of these mortgage-backed securities, a lot of this stuff with the subprime, it wasn't AAA. But here's the problem with the ratings agencies and how they make their money. They don't get paid from the federal government. It's, this isn't like a watchdog group, these ratings agencies. They get paid from the very companies that are submitting their documents to say, hey, look, we put this together. So here it is. Goldman Sachs put to get, puts together a, a financial instrument, and they deliver it to S&P, and they say, can you rate this for us, and we'll pay you after, after you do. What do you think S&P and these other, agency, other rating agencies are going to do? You think they're going to call it junk when Goldman Sachs wants it to be stamped AAA? No, they stamped it AAA when it was actually junk, and Goldman Sachs knew it was junk. So this was fraud. This was fraud. But, hey... 
S&P and the other ratings agencies, they wanted to get paid, right? So they, they played along. They played along. I think we have a repeat. I think we have a repeat in the bond market. But this time, because it's in recent memory, this was only a decade ago, the ratings agencies have to cover their rear ends a little bit better. So instead of saying a lot of this corporate debt is AAA or AA, they stamped it, a lot of it, triple B. Triple B is just a notch or two above speculative, speculative and junk. See where I'm going with this? If, and I think more a question of when, when the economy goes into recession or really starts to slow down, how are these companies going to be able to make these debt payments? And if they are not able to make these debt payments, then it makes it more likely that they will default. If they're more likely to default, then these ratings agencies have to come out and say, hmm, we got a downgrade. BBB, now you're junk. Now you're junk. What does this cause? This will cause a massive selling in the bond market. Why? Because a lot of companies who manage bonds by their own charters can only own investment grade securities. If the ratings agencies downgrade them to junk, it will be a massive selling. Huge sell-off, which is exactly what happened once everybody understood that all the subprime crap was crap. It was just a massive wave of selling. So it's just one place or the other. Regulators always regulate the last crisis. They don't regulate the next one. I think the next one can most definitely take place in the corporate debt market to some degree or another. Will it be a catalyst or the catalyst that kicks off all these other dominoes? Your guess is as good as mine, but it's definitely a domino in the row of dominoes. Is it the first one? Is it the second one, the last one? Don't know, but it's definitely in the mix. And when this goes, it ain't going to be pretty. So don't say I didn't warn you. Prepare yourself. Do what you got to do. Thank you so much for joining me today, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a pleasure having you as always. Please like, share, subscribe, get the word out. Leave your comments. I would love to hear from you. This is the Capital News. I am Alex Caritas. Godspeed.